we attract, there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. And sometimes you're like, oh, I met that partner and it was horrible, but you met like all your childhood wounds again and you got to work through yeah. it. And I hate saying that because I hear <laughs> everybody on the other end, like, please. Yeah. But I think when you, you do hold the space for the wounds that show up and heal them, you're not gonna be attracted to the same person anymore. Hello, beautiful people. On today's podcast, we have Jessica Baum. Jessica is the founder of the Relationship Institute of Palm Beach and owner of Be Selfful, which offers transformational courses and online coaching services that support individuals and couples to form healthy long-term relationships. She's been a therapist for over 10 years and is the author of the book, Anxiously Attached, Becoming More Secure in Life and Love. What I love about this conversation is Jessica gets straight to the core of the patterns of disconnect that show up in our relationships. This is not about blame or judgment. This is about taking ownership of our experience with ourselves and other people through self-awareness. Jessica shares helpfully the four attachment styles that reflect the way in which we behave in relationship and both in moment and long-term strategies to guide us to a space of safety, security, and connection. One of my favorite parts of this conversation is discussing attraction and how we can learn to begin attracting people through chemistry over core wounding. Please enjoy this conversation with Jessica. So Jessica, in your book, Anxiously Attached, in the beginning, you sort of share about your own personal experience of staying too long in relationships because you were afraid to be alone. And particularly what I personally resonated with was this experience of abandonment. And you kind of describe it in the book as like a gut gut falling to the floor experience. Personally, certainly in my 20s, I have vivid memories of this happening. And this experience was not only damaging to my relationship with others, obviously, but it was really damaging to my relationship with myself. And I think that's because personally I felt really out of control. I didn't know why I was having these experiences, um, Mm -hmm. but they were so intense in the moment. And they certainly shaped um, my relationships in my 20s, particularly in how I showed up and handled situations. So where I would love to start with you is for you to sort of share more about that experience of abandonment that you experienced. And particularly in relation to why do we experience these responses that we can feel so out of control with sure i mean so the neuroscience behind that is like kind of a dorsal shutdown and you know i explain in the book that you know there's a lot of fear stored in the gut that's like a memory center and and the heart is a memory stem center too but when you feel like the rug's been pulled out from underneath you and a connection has completely stopped it can um, bring up a lot of sensation in the body, especially if Mm -hmm. you have memories, implicit memories of trauma from earlier on or abandonment is something you experienced as a child, just in connection with your primary caregivers, if they were dissociated or whatever, it can elicit a lot of felt experiences in your body. And actually why I wrote the book was to help people feel like they're not crazy when they're having these experiences, it's actually your automatic nervous system signaling to you that you're in danger, that there's a threat. And when a baby can't get into connection, there's danger. And when an adult can't get back into connection, there's a signal of of danger coming to our body. So we can either go into sympathetic activation, or we can go and try to connect with our partner over and over again, or we can go into shutdown. If that doesn't work, it's like kind of a hopeless state and it can, um, it can hit your gut as well. It's certainly a conflicting experience being an adult and to an extent consciously being aware that your experience is a safe experience, but you are embodying this sense of danger and threat. Why is it that our experiences in our childhood, um, or how do they affect us so strongly still as an adult? Yeah, that's a good question. So when we're born as humans, we're not born fully developed. So we don't have a parasympathetic nervous system. We don't have a hippocampus. So when we're babies and we're in co-regulation, so we're in this dance with our primary caregiver, we are storing, we are programming our nervous system. We are storing sensation as memory. 
And the way in which we connect or disconnect or feel frightened gets stored too. And as we become adults, we attach in our adult relationships, our old ways of of signaling danger and our body will come to the surface when we reattach to an adult later. That's why it's very confusing. And these sensations are like, wow, what's going on in my body? And they're really like really old signals from your nervous system that something's wrong or something feels off and they can be de- debilitating. Um, yeah. So yeah, they're, they're implicit embedded memories, stored sensations. When we're in connection, we feel okay. When we sense disconnection in any way, Um, our body sends a signal to our brain that we're, we're in trouble because it's experienced that before on a primal level. So depending on your earlier experiences of connection and hardwiring or your attachment lens and how your patterns play out, you will re-experience some of those sensations, which can be really scary. And you mentioned this really important word, attachment, and obviously Mm -hmm. this is the basis to your book. Can you share more about what attachment styles are um, and particularly in relation to the two sort of primary ones that you focus on in your book? Yeah, I mean, so attachment styles are kind of going around now and there's four different attachment styles. There's secure, avoidant, anxious, and fearful avoidant for that's the way the general public refers to them. But they're really embedded patterns. And so when we're young, if we have a lot of attunement and co-regulation and care, we can form a sense of safety in the world and a more secure base. And so the insecure styles are the other three. And so anxious people, the one I wrote my book for, tend to have a theme of inconsistency. So like they can be hypervigilant or they're always waiting for the shoe to drop or they can have codependency traits but they're not feeling safe in connection that the connection will stay. That's why they need a lot of reassurance. And um, avoidant, which is the other coin, um, tends to um, not trust relationships as well, but instead of running towards, they shut down or they run away. And and I talk a lot about the book, like how these two partner up a lot. And, you Mm -hmm. know, I think all relationships have a relational dance because our embedded patterns combined with another person's embedded patterns, create the relational embedded patterns. And so that's, you're looking at a two-way system and and a collective energy of two people. So we can have more than one embedded pattern, but typically we have a default depending on who we attach to. And, you know, anxious people tend to run towards and try to get back into connection when they're scared and avoidant people tend to run away from intimacy. And when things get scary, they can shut down or distract or distance themselves. And the those two love to partner up. And I actually think there's a lot of healing that can happen in that dynamic when people start to really understand the nervous system and how, how they're responding. It gives them new language and new compassion to understand that sometimes your partner is actually in a triggered or awakened state where they're, you're not, not in, in feeling safe. And that's how they're, they're coping with that feeling as well. And why do those sort of two attachment styles in particular tend to partner up? So typically like anxious people are very lively and Mm -hmm. can be vulnerable and they just express a lot. They're very um, emotional as well. And avoidant people tend to be, look from the outside, very stoic, um, sometimes very independent and stable, appear stable and successful maybe, but they're attracted to the lost qualities within themselves. So the anxious person um, sometimes craves a little stability and thinks they're going to get that from the avoidant person. And the avoidant person actually craves a little liveliness and, and vulnerability and thinks, oh, well, that's interesting. That person is showing that. So they're actually attracted to some lost parts. And there's there's more to the attraction altogether, but um, it is very much opposite attraction. Mm. Yeah, it makes me think of uh, one of my past relationships, certainly in reflection of reading your book. I'd say I was more sort of the anxious one in that one and they're more avoidant. And I think as you're suggesting at the start of the relationship, I really felt like it was a um, representation of stability and Mm. what I sort of, you know, after the rose colored glasses sort of get taken off, I eventually realized it was more of an avoidance and it was, it was kind of that anxious external energy of kind of bouncing in front of them 
and then realizing that it wasn't necessarily stability that they had, but there was almost like a vacancy to that, which certainly Mm -hmm. um, triggered a lot in me. And I'd love to know sort of on that topic, connection is really like a biological imperative that you speak about. Why is it that being this biological imperative, we are obviously wired for connection, but in us seeking that at times, we actually experience the opposite effect. Mm -hmm. Because of core wounds get touched and fear around intimacy gets touched, Mm -hmm. or we shift into a state of fear Um, for an anxious person, it might be abandonment. And so they're shifting actually into a fear state in the sympathetic arousal and running towards and for an uh, avoidant person it's usually the fear of intimacy so they haven't connected with themselves they disconnect they disembody so the anxious person will track the body of another as a way that they learn to adapt and survive as a baby they're very attuned to their primary caregiver an avoidant person usually can um dissociate or are cut off from their body like when you say oh they were blank inside they were in Mm -hmm. a trauma state where they weren't really connecting to their body as a form of self-protection and if you experienced any of that as a child and our parents are doing the best they can but if they're going through some stressful states that would have imprinted on you and so when you re-experience that again it touched a really primal area in you and when we're out of connection and somebody else is disconnected from their body or their heart it can signal something's wrong here and you know so that's a a sign that you're you're picking up on you know somebody dissociating or or not being fully present because they're struggling as well. Yeah, this particular experience was really interesting because for for like for most of that relationship, it really was I was the anxious, they were avoidant, and I ended up breaking up with them, and it was fascinating so w- sort of within a few weeks of being broken up, the person sort of changed into more of the anxious attachment, which was really fascinating because it was a side of them that I'd never seen. Um, and it also made me go the opposite into this kind of avoidant. It was quite a fascinate, like fascinating experience of sort of changing attachment styles. Do you ever sort of experience that with clients? Sure. And I think, you know, underneath both is abandonment. It's just dealt right. with differently. Differently, And mm-hmm. yeah. And when you broke up with them, their fear of abandonment got kicked up. And right. so they were in the pursue mode. Had you gotten back together with them and got closer to intimacy, the roles would have reversed again, Yeah, most likely. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's the dance that, you know, if, if that partner wanted to get conscious uh, with you, could have done the work around, you know, the abandonment that's underneath there, but because the attachment wasn't present, they felt the space and the fear to then move back towards you. And if you had moved closer and felt safety, they probably would have backed up again. Yeah. I love that you mentioned the word conscious, because I think that was really the most important piece. And it was the piece that was missing. I think, you know, going back to sort of where we started, we, a lot of us sort of have these experiences that we don't feel like we can control and we don't truly understand. And I think that's what's so powerful about your book is Mm -hmm. that through learning about these attachment styles and how to uh, heal them, you start to realize that it's everyone experiences them to some extent and there's a way sort of forward in moving through them. And I know that polyvagal theory kind of plays into this Can you share more about how polyvagal theory and sort of the nervous system plays into our experience in this? Sure. Um, Yeah. So connection being a biological imperative pretty much comes from polyvagal. And um, for those of you that are listening, polyvagal is a type of, it's a, it's a, word made by Stephen Porges, who's a researcher, neuroscience and a researcher. And he, Um, studied the vagus nerve, which is a a system or a line in our body that connects our skull brain to our heart brain to our gut brain and really signals everything in our body up to our brain. And actually, we get a lot more information sent up than we do get sent down. And um, polyvagal just kind of really changed the course of therapy in terms of how we deal with the body and how we start to understand somatics. 
And our most evolved state of being is our social engagement system. So that's our ventral state. So that's where you and I feel very safe. We're in connection. We're making eye contact. Um, something, and he has another word called neuroception, something small, like my phone going off or you thinking about something. So it can be an inner or outer cue can take you out of a ventral state into sympathetic activation mm -hmm. or dorsal shutdown, which are older states in our nervous system. So polyvagal basically says that connections are a biolog biological imperative. We're not supposed to be in ventral state all the time. We're supposed to shift and we need to be in other states and we're blended states for many things. But sometimes when we're in relationships, we can get cued inner or outer just by our partner not being present. And it can send our system from ventral to sympathetic or, you know, it sends our system to alert danger. And I think it's really fascinating when you start to see that because then you know that's something that's coming up inside of you and you can start to get curious rather than to always blame your partner for the state that they're in. You can start to say, wow, they're, the state that they're in is connected to me and it's signaling something inside of my nervous system. So he was really, he's been a game changer um, in terms of how we look at the body and trauma and uh, just, you know, as there, as a psychotherapist, how we're really treating people from a bottom up. We're really starting to pay attention to the heart, brain, the muscles, the gut, and all the information that's being set up because that's where embedded trauma goes as well. So we store memory of good connections and hard connections in our heart center and often a lot of fear in our belly. Um, so, you know, these signals that are coming from below when we're in attachment are really important to start recognizing and that's pretty much why I wrote the book because there was so much going on in my body in my early twenties mm -hmm. and I felt a little crazy and, you know, I just wanted to get to the bottom of it and really explain what us therapists kind of know and what I've studied for years, but give it to the general public in kind of an easy digestible way. Yeah. It's, it's so incredibly powerful work. I think just being able to identify like scientifically just what's kind of happening, like sort of set even that personal experience aside and just be able to say like, this is, as you're saying, this is what's happening in the body. These are embedded memories that we're experiencing, which kind of plays into, I want to sort of talk to you about how to heal yourself. Cause I know a big part of your work is sort of enable to heal relationships. We have to kind of heal ourselves. And I'd love to talk to you sort of about in moment strategies that if we are sort of in that moment of being triggered that we can work with, but also kind of more long-term rewiring strategies to kind of be able to get us to a point that maybe we aren't so triggered in those moments that we normally are. So to sort of start with in moment strategies, what do you kind of recommend, say we are in a relationship and there are things that trigger us and we do feel sort of that really body reaction to whatever it is that we're experiencing? What's something in the moment that we can apply to kind of help us come back to maybe that ventral state? Yeah. Uh, so um, <clears throat> we can't help triggers, but I like to call them awakenings. What's being mm. awakened inside of me? Because Beautiful. by just shifting the word, it takes the tr shame or trauma attached and it says, oh, something's being awakened inside of me to hold, to get curious if you're really um, awakened to a sympathetic or activated to a sympathetic or a dorsal place, the, you can't stop the nervous system. You can't stop the reaction, you know? So, um, you know, and I talk about it in the book, the respiratory system is one system and deep breathing, particularly your exhales that can cue the brain because you're going to send a message to the brain that you're not running for sheer life. And so- right. Breath work actually does help and then getting out of the narrative. So usually we're in fight flight and we can pour a lot of gasoline and we can case build and we could start to blame. But when we start to really recognize, oh, wow, my system's activated right now. Can I get out of the story and try to get back into a calm place? Healing happens in relationships. Wounding happens in relationships. I don't believe that you have to necessarily heal alone. A big message in the book is actually we heal in healing relationships doesn't need to be a partnership, but um, people, other people in safe ventral states that are not judgmental and warm that can hold space for you when you're in pain can help with um, co-regulating or kind of getting you back to a ventral place. 
And it's not even about getting you back. It's about being with you in those moments so that you can be with those parts of you that are possibly regressed at that time. So yeah, I mean, breath work and, and getting out of the case building and really learning about the nervous system is definitely going to create awareness in your in your psyche and in your body to s- stop maybe having the reactions. Um, or it's going to even create some compassion that some of your behaviors really make sense when you start to understand, you know, your own need for connection and what kind of cues you um, into danger. And in working in partnership with people that you feel safe around, what is their communication or how is their communication best? Um, Because I think a lot of us can kind of almost panic a little bit if someone is in the activated state and we kind of go into this fix it mode. And I know that you kind of share more about just the power of just being with somebody and just being really present with somebody. Can you share Mm -hmm. more about that? Yeah. And I think sometimes it's hard when you're in a relationship with someone, um, if they're in an activated state, unconsciously it can cue your system into an activated state too, because we're connected. (laughs) Yeah. But if you're with a therapist or your partner is not in an activated state, then you can share, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in an activated state. This is what I need right now. Can you give this to me? Or you can bring it to another person who isn't in an activated state and see if they can hold the space for you. So yeah, sometimes it's it's also not about not getting activated. It's about getting curious about what's getting touched inside right. you. So you can kind of explore on a deeper level and have compassion for these experiences because they're old and archaic. And when you can start to be a witness of them, you can hold them, you can bring them to people who can hold them, your partner can understand them on a deeper level. You are shifting your relationship to those experiences. And that's actually part of the rewiring is a kind of, developing more of a dual awareness or like an observer mind of them. Can you elaborate more on sort of what that observer mind looks like? It's as simple as, wow, I feel a little, uh, even today I was feeling a little shut down, you know, um, all day actually. And I just said, oh, well, it's okay. I'm feeling a little shut down today. And Mm you know, what do I need to help myself? It's not about right. necessarily getting yourself out of that state. It's about recognizing that this is where I'm at and what is this touching inside me and how can I be tender with myself today and take it a little easier. And so I think you start to tend to yourself differently and you start to pull in people who are warm and supportive when you're in more tender places and you stop blaming everyone for cueing you on or off right. you start to know that like no one's trying to do this stuff on purpose yeah it really is that transformation from like blaming other people or feeling crazy that's certainly a word I, I resonate with you in my 20s that's really how I felt I felt crazy to now just sort of being able to bring that element of self-compassion as you're suggesting like not forcing yourself to 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 be anything or go anywhere, but just to be okay with how you are in that moment. I think there's so much um, healing just just in that. It's it's such a beautiful practice that I think many of us can kind of skim over looking for something that seems more practical. I just want to say we live in cultures where like if I said I was in a shutdown state, many people would be like, go for a walk, get to the gym, do right. this. That's <laughs> very like activate your state rather than yeah. be... Sometimes you just need to be with what is right. present. Because I think that's what happens, isn't it? It is, it's almost a form of escapism in itself when you may be feeling, you know, for example, shut down. And it's like, I got to get to the gym. Like I got to do this. And it's kind of like for some people that may help to an extent, but I think for some people it's, it's an avoidance strategy. It's not actually addressing why you are feeling how you were feeling. Um, So I think you're right. And I think that's also what I've learned is like, we're all different and different things work for each of us. And I think that's such an important part of healing thyself is really getting to know what works for you personally. Yeah. And I think, you know, in the book, I call them protectors. And I think we have them, whether it's online shopping, the gym, a cookie, a glass of wine, and there is absolutely no shame in, you know, needing a protector to come out or a behavior that helps you cope. But you want to become aware, okay, this is why I'm having this glass of wine, or 
I'm going to the gym right now. Is that what I really need? Or is this just helping me cope with something that's uncomfortable that will be there again? Do I, mm-hmm. Can I sit in it a little longer? And, you know, as you do the work, you start to sit with uncomfortable sensations a little bit longer and longer, and you don't need as many coping or protector behaviors. Um, so it's not like on a really bad day, I might still use coping behaviors that I don't necessarily love, but I'm not judging myself, but I'm like, right. okay, this is what I need today. And on a good day, you know, I, I more resourced and I can sit in more of my experience. So it's never about judgment. It's mostly about awareness. And sort of, you know, we're talking about these awakenings and being able to meet them with, you know, a beautiful breathing technique and also to be sort of become aware of the narrative that we're speaking to ourselves is there sort of a separation in terms of like what kind of work can we do that maybe isn't during those awakening moments but are actually sort of us taking initiative to sort of work through our core wounds um, outside of those sort of activated experiences? Yeah, and I think, well, I think sharing with a therapist, a coach, a friend, a non-judgmental person, looking at your patterns and maybe even tracing them back to, you know, what are the themes in your life that get touched or repeated over and over again, because we can create a million different such situations externally that look different, but the internal feelings tend to be thematic in our lives. So starting to locate them um, and really kind of tying them in. And I think for a lot of people recognizing that sometimes sensations come up and we don't have a memory of them, we can't put them into an explicit memory. So, you know, just starting to become aware of like what really gets touched inside of me and, and, you know, just bringing awareness to it, I think, and and the gentleness to that we're all carrying. I think even the most secure people, especially partnered with someone very avoidant or very anxious, things are going to get touched and, um, you know, attachment's not static. So it's an opportunity to keep looking within and and exploring. And earlier we sort of spoke about say the anxious attachment style being sort of attracted to an avoidant attachment style. Can you share more about how we can begin to sort of be attracted through chemistry rather than core wounding? Yeah, I think if, you know, if you're listening and you, and you, and you're attracted to someone who doesn't text you back or love bombs the hell out of you or is inconsistent in any way, or you're trying your sense of self-worth is like intrigued by them. Mm -hmm. I would say that you're probably going to end up with your heart broken. Like (laughs) it's, um, it's, it's like that feeling of trying to get the hard to get person. I call them the bad boy, but it's not really the bad boy. It's the unavailable. Um, especially for someone who's anxious, you want someone who's consistent and calm and steady. The -hmm. thing is our system might not recognize that as safety. You know, we might be attracted to something that is a little more chaotic because that's what our system is recognizing. And I think, you know, our energetic blueprint or our signature of what we, we attract, there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. And sometimes you're like, oh, I met that partner and it was horrible, but you met like all your childhood wounds again and you got to work through yeah. it. And I hate saying that because I hear <laughs> everybody on the other end, like, please. Yeah. But I think when you, you do hold the space for the wounds that show up and heal them, you're not going to be attracted to the same person anymore because you will have healed that. So the, the attraction or the appeal goes away. You're no longer attracted to the unavailable person and you you start to gravitate to people who are more available. Yeah, that's... That's so fascinating that you say that. What do people do in that experience? Like say they sort of go into a relationship and they're drawn because of their core wounding and they begin to heal their core wounding and say, let's talk about marriages, for example, it's sort of a deeper sense of commitment. What do you recommend to people that sort of may still want to be with that person, but that level of attraction has kind of lowered because of their healing. How do they, do you kind of encourage them to focus on more um, healthy ways of finding attraction in the relationship? Like where do people go if that's kind of the position they find themselves in? Well, I think there's a level of attraction in the beginning called the honeymoon phase. And then I think a lot of relationships shift into what we call power struggles or the more complicated phase where the wounding shows up. And I think if the wounding is worked out well, it actually shifts to a deepening. So there's an intimacy that's brought to the relationship when both people can do their work. 
So I would say the the love grows, but it grows in a new way. And and the the sense of interdependency, which I talk about a lot in my book is I can be fully me and you can be fully you and you can go out in the world and feel safe and I can go out in the world and feel safe. And when we come back together, we bring new energy into the relationship rather than a fear or a power struggle. We're bringing that in, which brings excitement and, and just kind of replenishes the relationship. But again, getting to that stage can be really hard because sometimes we have to go through layers of healing um hopefully together and often people break up in the power struggle phase because the wounding can be very deep or the they don't have proper support or some of the things are left unconscious and they think that there's something wrong and they just haven't been able to work through it and that makes me so sad because i think our society sets us up for like quote unquote what we think a relationship should look like and yeah I just think relationships bring up our stuff. Like if it's freaking <laughs> yeah. you and you're attaching deeply to someone, it's going to get touched. And whether right. or not the dynamic can work through it is another thing or easier dynamics than not. But to think that your stuff isn't going to come up in close bonds, that that theory, I don't know. I think that's part of the work of, of being in a relationship. I don't, I think they're work at times and I think they're worth it at times, but I also think some of them can be really challenging. Yeah, I think that's the most important part, isn't it? It's like sometimes it really does serve to work with a professional that can kind of help you to be able to see when it's worth kind of leaning in and continuing to do the work and when it may be time, particularly as you're suggesting, if you're not met by your partner being open to work with you, that it's best to kind of continue on separately because of that. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I wrote this book for people who are in partnership and people who are single, because it doesn't really matter when you decide to do the work. And I found that to be the most important, like empowering thing. Um, You know, yeah, it's sad. I think if you have two people that are willing to do the work and they're getting stuck in sympathetic activation on both sides, Mm -hmm. when you're in a survival state, you can't access empathy. You can't really see clearly you're in your wound. And so sometimes you need somebody else on the outside to help kind of show you where you Mm -hmm. guys are getting stuck. And I've done sessions where just one or two sessions, there's like light bulb moments where they, people can see, it wasn't really about the garbage or it wasn't really about, (laughs) it was about my sense of self-worth or it was about my abandonment wound. And as soon as you start to dig, dig a little deeper, usually your partner starts to develop empathy for the experience and vice versa. And that's actually what's healing is starting to unpack what's going on on a deeper level. And it usually transforms the relationship. But yeah, sometimes it's hard to figure out on your own. What does being selfful look like? Well, selfful is a state of being. So I talk about selfless, selfful, and selfish. And selfless is like in a self-abandonment state um, of sympathetic activation. And selfish is also a sympathetic activation of survival Selfful is a state of ventral connection. It's a state of warm, safety, expansion, curiosity in your relationship rather than, you know, judgment or blame. And the truth is we shift out of these states all day long. It's not like we're in one or the other. I will say that you can have in in your, everybody might be saying, well, I shift more to the selfless, the self-sacrifice or, or my partner is more of the selfish. And they just, sometimes there's a pairing that goes on. It's similar (laughs) to the anxious avoidant, but those are both just survival states. Once you start to understand them, we are trying to get to a place of safety, mutual connection, fluidity, you know, boundaries that work just, it's a, it's a place of just feeling like you're being seen and heard in your relationship and and having connection. And can you share more sort of in being able to move to more of this self-full place, this this place of safety and connection for people that are listening that may really feel like, you know, going back to my experience in my 20s when I felt out of control and really like there was no way out of those experiences. Can you share more about how, I guess, neuroscience to an extent, being able to rewire the brain, being able to have patience in this journey um, is all possible for anyone that's wanting to seek a different life. Yeah. So if, if you're listening and you're really struggling in trauma states, you pretty much, well, with anxious attachment, and I would say with the insecure attachment, there is there can be a d- missing development 
developmental link of self-regulation. Mm -hmm. So there, it can be really, really challenging to self-regulate. And so if you're really dysregulated all the time, you actually do need another human. This is, human doesn't have to be a therapist, but a non-judgmental human, because it's their system in ventral that actually meets your system and creates a sense of safety inside of you. And that's what you didn't get enough of as a child. So sometimes it's about joining community or finding, you know, if you're doing the work to earn security, it's about finding a couple friends that will sit there, not fix you, not do anything, but be present and compassionate for you. And it's their system that can help regulate you. If you can afford a therapist and hopefully that therapist doesn't try to fix you, but really just holds the space and allows that to be there and links some things back for you. Slowly, your system will release more and more. Sometimes it gets a little, it can get a little harder before it gets easier because your system's <laughs> starting to recognize that there's safety. So more memory might come up to the surface, but the more you hold those memories that you, you lead to integration in your brain. So they get released from the neural net they get experienced and then they're re-experienced in the presence of someone who actually can hold them with you. And in, in that experience, you're releasing them and they're kind of changing um, into a form of like integration in your brain. That's like the best way I can explain. I mean, and that's essentially what therapy is. I mean, we heal like in, in the nervous system sense with another person's nervous system holding that safe space that we might have not gotten before. Yeah, I feel like personally, I really experienced that. And it was something interesting that came up for me through that integration process was actually sort of experiencing a new form of anxiety around the feeling of safety because it felt so foreign that it almost felt unsafe. Is this sort of like playing into the same practice that you sort of share in relation to the other experiences of sort of being able to just be really like, present with yourself and sort of connect with those sensations and be able to kind of teach yourself, rewire your brain to know that safety is actually safe. Yeah. And and that's where anxious people too can feel like they're really vulnerable. And, and mm. the truth is that there's an avoidance with the anxious as well. They're also avoiding things. And so when we come into the present of more embodied, safe people, we have to face more and more of ourselves. And <laughs> yeah. That can be scary. You know, it yeah. can be really scary to be seen and held. If that's a new experience for you, it's, there's a sense of vulnerability that comes up. And so, yeah, I think your system, if in the presence of that enough, and, and Polly Bagel would say this, will start to gravitate towards that naturally because our human wiring and design is to reach out to warm, safe connection. That's really when you peel back all the layers, that's what kind of how we're built. So if it happens, just go slowly and continue to be in the presence of warm, non-judgmental pe people. And eventually your system will start to gravitate towards that. Mm, beautiful. Well, thank you for this conversation, Jessica. I have found um, your book and what you share with it um, very helpful. It was very... Um, helpful to be able to reflect on particularly some of the lines of questioning that you ask and being able to draw back um, our behaviors back to our early experiences. So thank you for that. Thank you. I love it when someone really reads the books and loves it. <laughs> it means so much to me. And <laughs> yeah. Thank you for helping me get the message out there. I know there are so mm. many people who want to understand themselves on a deeper yes. level, especially when it comes to romantic relationships. I really feel like, I mean, this is a personal opinion, but I just, I feel like it's almost like it's the most important as you're saying, it's like, you know, we have this sort of societal romanticization of like relationships, but really they're like this opportunity for us to kind of integrate and become whole. And it's, it's a pretty messy experience at time, but I think it's yeah. such a beautiful and important one. So you're certainly in a really lovely line of work. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. So I'd love to ask you on a final note, Jessica, what does it mean to you to be human? <sighs> well, for me, what does it mean to be human? For me lately, it's to be embodied and to be present with myself in compassionate ways. And um, I think lately small things have been impacting me so i think just to be human is to be moment to moment and realize how interconnected 
we all are and how kind of cool that is and how much support there is. And I think being human is also about like learning lessons. And I hate saying that because I'm like, <laughs> oh man, another lesson. And yeah, I'm yeah. a therapist, but like, don't think that I don't continuously right. learn my own lessons. And so there's humility around like, okay, how do I need to grow or stretch right now? And how can I surrender to that? And um, yeah, just honoring your journey, I guess, wherever it takes you.